It's time to welcome the Wine Ladies with Georgia and Suzanne. An entertaining hour topped up with great ideas about wine, where to dine, anything and everything to do with the vine. Great conversation, lots of laughter, guests from all walks of life, food and wine, music, art, sports, and much more, all on The Wine Ladies. Hi everybody, it's us, the Wine Ladies. I'm Georgia. And I'm Suzanne, and welcome to the Wine Ladies, one sip at a time. Thank you so much for joining us here this afternoon. And we've got a great show lined up for you today. First of all, we've got a fantastic guest that we know you guys are really gonna enjoy meeting. And we've also got an incredible lineup of the finest European dating back four or five even more. And when I say European blank, I don't mean wine. We're talking about something else here. That's right. We are going to join, uh, we are going to enjoy the purest, the finest, the most flavorful beers today. Whether it's an ale mm -hmm. or a lager, we're going to learn how to pour. It's going to be a fantastic, interesting show. And joining us to go over all of that and much more, he is one of only four Canadians wow. to have been a knighted. A knight? Yes, a exactly, knight exactly, wow. of the Belgian Brewers Association. Mm. He is also a champion of Belgian beers for over 25 years. He is also the president of McClellan Premium Imports. Please welcome Guy McClellan, the beer knight. <laughs> hey, Guy. <laughs> welcome to the wine ladies. <laughs> it's a tremendous honor to be here with you. Well, thank Look you. Look at the display you brought. My, my. My, I didn't even know there was such a, an array of beers in existence. My goodness. You know, that's a really good setup for a point about, um, say, we Canadians or North Americans mm -hmm. are still somewhat unaware of yes. the history and the uh, styles and tastes that have been around a long, long time in various key beer producing regions of Europe. Now, I think we should start off with, first of all, we said to everybody in the opening that we have a beer knight sitting here. Only one of four. Like I've I never said, met Canadians. a knight before. So what exactly? Exa Where's your sword? <laughs> uh, it's in my other suit. Oh, okay. <laughs> Actually, it's, it's casual Friday today. Okay. So what exactly did you have to do to become a, a knight? It was such a great honor, actually. Well, essentially, uh, the brewing industry in Belgium, which is a very small country, mm -hmm. it's less than the population of Ontario, and you could probably fit it between here and, you know, say, Windsor. Yeah. Anyway, uh, beer is a very important uh, product there uh, that's loved, of course, but also an export product. Mm -hmm. It's one of very few countries in the world that exports more than they consume. Ah. And they do consume a fair bit. The drinking age is 16. There's a licensed wow. establishment for every 50 inhabitants. How civilized wow. is that? Mm -hmm. wow. And uh, their per capita consumption would be in the top 10 countries of the world. So wow. anyway, um, industry and trade gets behind big export industries. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a Brewers Guild that dates back, believe it or not, to the 4th century. Wow. Um, wow. And these are the guys, the men in gowns, basically, who, who knighted me. And they do so by recognizing, um, say, half a dozen people a year mm -hmm. who have somehow distinguished themselves in aiding their export industry and trade. And wow. I was knighted beside the U.S. ambassador that year, as a matter of fact. Wow, that is well. exciting. I don't think he was a big beer drinker. But no, anyway. how did he get knighted anyways? I have no idea. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's because the U.S. buys a lot of Belgian beer. Ah, you know, that, that How be. did you first get interested in beer? Well, that, that's a long story. Um, growing up in Winnipeg, I was always a beer lover. Okay. And uh, don't tell my mom, but I had a few before I was 18. Did but anyways, oh, really? um, that would have been legal in Belgium. <laughs> it would have been. It would have been. That's the way it should be. Anyways, <laughs> anyways. Um, so uh, I just I've actually worked in beer my entire working career, starting in market research with uh, Labatt Breweries, right oh, right out okay. of school. Okay. So I've uh, always been interested in beer. And um, when I worked for Angus Reed in Winnipeg in a research company, you know, I was working on banks, the Liberal Party of Canada, uh -huh. McGavin's Bread, Canada Trust, you know, Johnson's Tampons. And this is way more exciting. Beer. <laughs> oh, and, beer. Okay. and beer. And guess and what? And beer was the best product the, to work with. The beer was the funnest client. <laughs> yes. Surprise, no surprise. kidding. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So you brought in, I mean, when we were doing a little bit of research on this, I thought, wow, like such an assortment of beer. And it's, it, there's a lot of parallels, actually, between beer and wine as well. Um, maybe we can start off. Is there like sort of a general sort of theme to what we're doing here? We're starting from light, moving on to dark which is also right. an We've, interesting question. Yeah, there are some um, well, um, widely held myths mm -hmm. that, that Canadians and North Americans have about beer, for sure. Well, let's bust some of those We myths. are going to bust a few, <laughs> I think. But what's going on on the table here, really, is a range of beers. And as you mentioned, they are actually arranged 
from lightest mm -hmm. in taste okay. to strongest in taste. Does that um, have nothing to do with the color? Has nothing to do with the color. Do we got it? We're gonna bust that one right now. There yeah, let's go. do it. Oh, okay. bust. Um, let's bust that one. So um, pure beer mm -hmm. is four ingredients according to the Bavarian purity law, which is really the foundation of all beer purity discussions. Let's okay. just say, and those four ingredients are very simply water, water, hops, hops, malt, malt, and yeast. And, and, yeast. A, and, and a comment on the malt is that it must be either 100% pure barley or a mixture of barley and wheat and ah, nothing else and anything okay. that isn't those things is not real on, beer on one hand makes it not technically a beer according uh -huh. to that purity law okay mm. but uh, they are also known as adjuncts and it's kind of funny and I don't think there's a direct connection but it sounds a lot like the word junk Oh. <laughs> As a matter of fact, just a coincidence. I he think. didn't say that. No. I'm, not an English, I'm not an English major. You don't want to get in trouble, do you? <laughs> Pure malt is always best. So, you know, if you know nothing about beer mm -hmm. and, and you want to just inquire about the quality of a beer maybe that you're going to try or taste, one of the first questions to ask might be the style, but it might be actually what's the malt made out of. Because ah, okay. that's going to tell you a lot about its quality and its purity. Now, will that be evident on the bottle or do you have to sort of ask somebody in the know or search the web? Ye it's kind of all of the above. Um, you know, the, um, the big beer companies in Canada have successfully lobbied against full food labeling on uh -huh. beer. Okay. So you don't see full disclosure. Uh -huh. And um, in advertising, they're not going to tell you if right. it isn't pure. So you need to find out. Uh -huh. But will they tell you? Do Buyer they do beware, as they say. Yeah. If it is pure, mm -hmm. yeah. they're much more likely to tell you. Right, that makes so sense. So a Bavarian yeah. Purity Law product will likely sense. say so on the label. Okay. Now this is cool. I know I'm jumping ahead, but I love champagne. Yes, you are. So I'm, uh, we got a champagne You like stout? cork top bottles, is Yeah, I do, and a little <laughs> champagne. <laughs> we have a couple I'm of those here. Rightfully <laughs> gravitating to you them. You know, the fact there are cork top bottles on the table is one indication in itself about the long history of beer and mm. beer being packaged for later consumption, probably not unlike wine in that sense. Uh -huh. um, but anyways, yeah, uh, those are some very old styles. The Mort Sabit that you just pointed out mm -hmm. is a Lambic beer, mm -hmm. and you, you might appreciate this one, being the wine ladies. Uh -huh. uh, Lambic beer is one of very few technical terms and legally protected terms that brings, um, that makes an analogy between beer and grape growing regions of France. Uh, oh, which means so this is a region. Lambic is a, is a region? Lambic is, yeah. believe it or not, the indigenous yeast strain of the oh. Zen Valley of Brussels. Oh, wow. Where beer would be spontaneously fermented, uh -huh. and that means open to the air. Uh -huh. Because remember, in the old, old days, before microbiology, no one knew what yeast were really. Mm -hmm. It was kind of magic that happened. Magic, yeah. right? magic happened. Yeah. And yes. likely the first beers, probably not unlike the first wines, were accidentally discovered mm -hmm. by being left in the sun with straw and a pail and the air falling on it and all that stuff. Anyway, yeah. Britannomyces lambicus lives in the Zen Valley of Brussels. Uh -huh. A beer that would be traditional uh, in terms of spontaneous fermentation, fermented by that wild yeast, mm -hmm. can only be called lambic. Uh -huh. A beer okay. made that way anywhere else cannot be called lambic. So it's like uh -huh. champagne has to be done in champagne. Exactly. It's the same kind of so, idea. Mm -hmm. So there actually are examples in the beer world, especially in Europe, um, that, that have that kind of connection in a way to how wine has been treated. I have a question as well in, re in respect to price. Um, I know we're going to get into some of these and it sounds yep. like some of them are aged actually for quite a long time in wood and like we were saying a lot of similarities with wine. But how do all these beers um, how, like how, how are they when it comes to buying a bottle of beer? Is it like very, very expensive like it is in wine? Well, no, actually, I think that is one of the, you know, s best kept secrets mm -hmm. to date. And that is that you can actually possibly buy like what arguably could be one of the very best beers in the entire world for probably less than $4 a bottle. Oh, so wow, if, I, wow. if I made that statement about wine, that wouldn't yeah. Be, yeah. I wouldn't be talking $4 a bottle no, probably. No. And you know, I'm not trying to make a direct comparison in terms of their cost of production, yeah. but I think it, it, it does say that uh, top end beers of Europe are probably one of the very best values mm -hmm. that makes yeah. sense. in the alcohol mm -hmm. industry, let's just say, or, right. or uh, products available to consumers. Oh. That's amazing they can do that because, oh, are, I don't know, is it a question also of quantity? Like how can they keep, it, keep the price down so low? Do you know what I'm saying? Or is it the cost of production less, maybe? Like you know, it's probably a very complicated economic okay. <laughs> model, but I would just it's say, you know It's an algorithm of some kind. <laughs> part of the price you can charge is what people are willing to pay. True. Yeah, and that's true. And today, especially in North America, I think beer still has a little bit of a, um, how, how should I say, um, the, the ordinary man's beverage, let's mm -hmm. just say. Yeah, right? well, and, association with sports. And, and who in their right mind would pay, you know, 
twenty dollars for a bottle of beer, right? right so right. I think there's a bit of that in terms of uh, okay. you know supply and demand and what can the price be and all that kind of stuff. Some of these have very expensive uh, production mm -hmm. uh, processes. Okay. So. Now, I Why have a question. We, What's yeah. the difference between an ale and a lager? I always get confused okay, about so that. Okay, so that's beer 101 question there number one, probably. The one. <laughs> um, very, uh, a couple interesting things about lager and, and ale I'll just touch on that are maybe relevant. If we come to discussing uh, food uh, matching, yes. mm -hmm. um, think of ale as red wine and lager as white wine. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's a robustness with ale. Anyways, uh, the real answer to the question is it's simply technically top fermentation versus bottom fermentation. Uh -huh. And until you learn a little bit about history and the, and the Industrial Revolution and things like that and what was possible, um, the story starts to make sense. You know, a, a, a so brewer, ales are top fermentation? Top fermentation. Okay, and that's the more robust beer. Yeah, like and, I'll, and I'll explain why in a second. Historically, all beer was ale. Oh. And the reason why is that historically, until actually quite recently, mm -hmm. there was no such thing as uh, controlled temperature or refrigeration. Uh, that's true. So okay. historically, in the temperate uh, latitudes of, of the world, which were grain produced, grain production occurred, mm -hmm. as opposed to, say, grape, yeah. um, actually, beer would be fermented, more or less, at room temperature. Temp temperature, right. right? And compared to minus 272 Kelvin, Plus 15 is pretty warm. Uh huh. Yeah. So, so you get, you get actually yeast cells mm -hmm. that are single cell living organisms who like warm temperature. Right. 15 Celsius is warm, remember? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they, well, they have one of the greatest lives in the world. The yeast does? Yeah. They, they don't last long, though. They have a lot of sex and they make beer. This <laughs> can't be that bad. So, anyways, I think that's the best quote of the show. They do so. They do so, though, at a very high rate because biologically speaking, 15C is actually quite warm. And okay. as we all know, stuff happens faster at higher temperatures. Yes. Temperature itself is the measure of motion of molecules, mm -hmm. right? So, okay. anyway, they uh, do their job very quickly. Huh. They actually party on up to the top of the vat. <laughs> And they make a cake on the top, actually, when they're done. Uh, you, oh, it you, is a big maybe, party. <laughs> if you've seen pictures of open fermenters, you'll see a big cake Ooh. on the top. Okay. How do we get an invite? <laughs> top fermentation is fermentation that's sometimes also called warm fermentation. Yeah. And it's the historical type of fermentation because okay. we couldn't control that temperature. Right, we couldn't keep it chilled. Well, any guesses on when, let's see, electricity was invented? 1800s. 42, 1842. Very oh, good. Very All right, good. I know okay. my history. Okay, here's the next question. Thomas any, Edison. Any guesses on when refrigeration was invented? Probably quite oh, a bit wow. further because I, I think like they still had ice boxes like in the 1920s. Well, so I'm I sure ice probably... boxes still exist somewhere, but it actually also was 1842. Oh, it was? Did, are you oh. serious? Next question. Oh. Okay. When do you think wow. the first lager was produced? 1842. Two. Oh. 1842. <laughs> Close enough. Way to go, Suzanne. We got one right. In a place, in a place called Pilsen, Pilsen, it's Pilsner Czech beer. Republic. Oh, okay. The term Pilsner mm -hmm. is the original term for a lager beer. Oh, oh interesting. Pilsner. My grandmother okay. used to like Anyways, Pilsner. so lager was only invented, let's just say, in 1842. Okay. Um, and that's actually quite recent relative to the history of beer. That could go back as far as 10,000 years, right? Oh, that's so lager's a new thing. Mm. And guess what? There were reasons why brewmasters wanted to experiment with fermentation at cooler temperatures. Uh -huh. Now that they could control that, yeah. experimentation obviously followed. Next thing you know, the yeast strains that used to ferment the beer uh -huh. didn't work. Uh -huh. yeah. But sure enough, they found other yeast strains right. that actually liked the cooler temperatures. Okay. And they still had sex and made beer, yeah. but they did so <laughs> at a slower he likes pace. saying that. Not, I as, can not tell. as vigorously. <laughs> Tantric sex. How's that? Yeah. So, oh, yoga. Okay. Anyways, so they would, they would do so at a slower pace and quite literally fall down to the bottom of the fermentation oh, tank. Oh, that's very Bottom fermentation. Wow, yeah. So if you were taking any exam on the difference between lager and ale, yeah. the correct answer would be top fermentation versus mm -hmm. bottom fermentation and for hot lager. And cold. <laughs> but, okay. you know, when you tell the little story of history and how that's it happened, very interesting. Yeah, it suddenly awesome. it makes sense. It just, it's almost common sense yeah. that you can okay. understand why. I think when I think of trying to remember like which is like between the ale and the lager, I always think like LL, like the lager is light, LL, mm -hmm. and then by default, obviously. 
the ale is not. So that's kind of how I remember. Right. I mean, well, you now know, I'm going to remember because of that story. Now I will <laughs> never forget. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. awesome. Thank well, you. it is. It is true that because all those processes happen at a slower pace. Yeah. Guess what? The product is less robust. Uh huh. So there's less esters, less flavors. It's just a lazier beer, and you know, potentially negative term is. Would it be is more of a female beer than a lager? Not Would necessarily. It, no. Not necessarily, but you know. In general, you yes. will expect a lager to be lighter tasting than an ale. Yeah. But I can tell you at this table, yes. the interaction of some of these four ingredients we talked about give you different than expected results, let's just say. So that's one of your myth busters, I think, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay, well, we won't be able to talk about all the beer, but why don't we pick a few of your favorites uh, that we could maybe get into more, more okay. details on? How, how many yeah. is a few? I know, maybe three, <laughs> three maybe. Because we'll he's thinking, which ones do I want to choose? Well, this is a non-alcoholic beer, first of all, that you brought in. That the you're first making. one, uh, Erdinger Alcohol Free. Yeah. Uh, we have three Erdinger products here. Okay. Uh, most German beer brand names, by the way, this will help you in a bigger picture uh, arena also on beer. Mm -hmm. The ER on the end of a German beer brand means of. Uh-huh, okay. The, the letters preceding the ER is the name of the place it came from. Oh, okay. Basically. So okay. Erdinger Tamina is in the wine business. of <laughs> Erding, of Erding. There's a family-owned brewery in Erding, which is 30 minutes northeast of Munich, which is in the heart of the wheat belt in uh -huh. southern Germany, okay. province of Bavaria, home of the Bavarian Purity Law. It is a Bavarian Purity Law beer. Okay. That means this, right? right. Four, Four ingredients. ingredients. Four ingredients. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to pour a little bit of that just to give a little taste. So okay. that I, why, why I want to do that is to surprise you. Okay. Ooh, I love surprises. Because it's Bavarian Purity Law, we, it uses actually the same mash, which means the ingredients in the kettle, yeah. as the Erdinger Weiss beer, which is the world's number one selling wheat beer, by the way. Okay. But anyway, it's Bavarian Purity, and the food energy is in there to fuel the yeast for the fermentation. However, they interrupt fermentation, mm -hmm. and uh, therefore that energy is still in there. So Erdinger Alcohol Free is not only like a flavorful Bavarian Purity Law beer, so yeah. this is actually going to taste good. It is wheat, so it'll be light. Mm -hmm. And uh, but the other thing is, it's an energy drink. An oh, energy really? drink. So if you've ever had um, wow. an an wow. energy bar or a protein bar or totally. a meal replacement bar, yeah. If you look at the numbers, they'll usually have somewhere around 30 grams of carbs. Yeah. 27. And they actually market this beer. I don't think my trainer would say, go ahead and have a beer. What is the energy bar or a beer? Hmm. I don't know. I don't know how I'm going to get that by. Well, they have. Well, we're supposed to stay away from <laughs> alcohol. Why not? I mean, work. this is a healthy. Didn't you uh, say you also have to watch how you pour because of the yeast on the bottom or something? That's yeah. where the flavor That's is? A, we want to get the a cloudiness lot of head on that, uh, from beer. the bottom. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. um, that looks good. That looks, only, looks like a whipped cream uh, cake. Only a pure malt beverage will actually uh, stack the head. That looks gorgeous. Oh, really? So that's one way of knowing your Let's malt isn't pure. Let's get a shot of that. Oh, is, it is it won't stack. Okay, so that, that's a really good point, actually. So and I'm just going to get the rest of the uh, B vitamin complex out of there. <laughs> There's a lot of vitamins in there. This is, I couldn't believe it's like, almost how healthy too pretty, beer is. Too pretty two to of drink. These, two of these beers is 40% yeah. of your RDA for B vitamin complex. Really? And as we all know, those wow. are the anti-aging vitamins for skin and hair. All right, I'll order a case. Yeah. <laughs> and this, this is where you guess my age. Oh, oh. I'm going to say 28. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you. No. I'm going to say 31. <laughs> okay, 93. Oh, wow. Right, 93. That stuff works. Okay. Now, maybe. Oh, here, Georgia, got to oh, blow, blow the Take a little taste away. of that. Oh. Now, how do you... Is there a way to get past the foam? Like, I'm going to get it all like, oh, you've got a new color of lipstick on, Georgia. Well, the, bill, the, beer, will, the beer will slide under it, actually, if you tilt the glass. But I'll, just be I'll hold your hair back. Okay, careful. go. So that's a beautiful Bavarian wheat glass. That's a very traditional that's style gorgeous. of glass. That's mm, gorgeous. That tastes good. I'm going to smell it. That tastes real. Do I have a mustachio? No. No. Not more than <laughs> usual. Uh, <No>. <laughs> <laughs> that tastes very good. You know what? Couldn't resist. What's good about that guy mm. is that sometimes when you go out, you're, you feel like having yeah. a drink with everybody, and you don't want to sit there I with a glass, the glass of Perrier water. That's beautiful. So this is a great thing to have with no alcohol. That's gorgeous. Right, and really yeah. the point I'd like to make, Yeah. growing up in Winnipeg and being a great beer lover that I am, probably up until the time I discovered this product, I would say I would rather poke sharp sticks in my eyes than, <laughs> than drink a non-alcoholic beer. Oh. <laughs> now that I've discovered one that actually tastes good and mm. I know is, is pure food, it's natural, and it actually there are some great you know, uh, health benefits to this beer yeah. um, as a replenishment beverage, 
they sponsor the Hawaiian awesome. Ironman, the German Olympic team, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, they do so as a sports energy drink.